and welcome back to Complex Analysis. Today is Complex Analysis Lecture 8, and we're going to be talking about homotopy. So what is homotopy? Well, here's the thing. Last time, we talked about path independence of contour integrals. Now, if that was true for all integrals, that would be so nice because, you know, we don't even have to care about the path anymore. We barely even have to care about the function. It's basically just a regular integral from endpoint 1 to endpoint 2. We don't even care about the contour point anymore. But unfortunately, that's not true for every single function. Before, I highlighted that it wouldn't be true for any non-holomorphic functions, simply because the Cauchy-Riemann equations, which we used to prove them, don't apply. But it also doesn't apply for some paths. So how can we know whether under a domain, a function, a path that are both in a certain domain, well, let's say we have two curves, how can we know when the contour integral of f over one curve is equal to the contour integral over another? For simplicity, we're going to assume that both curves are parametrized from 0 to 1. Of course, if they're not, and they're parametrized from A to B, all you need to do to fix that is first find what B minus A is, then divide everything by B minus A, so it's gamma of B, P over B minus A now, and then, of course, it's going to be 0 plus some constant, comma 1 plus some constant, and you have to figure out what that constant is and add it to that, and then there you go. This is the exact same curve, except it's now from 0 to 1 instead of from A to B. So, now how do we know when two curves are parametrized over 0 to 1 that the path integral of a holomorphic, which means the derivative exists, function will be the same? Well, we have to look for something called a homotopy. What is a homotopy? Well, it's essentially something that morphs curve 1 into curve 2. So let's call the blue one gamma 0 and the white one gamma 1. Now, how do we morph gamma 0 into gamma 1. Well, there are infinitely many ways to do it, but one way would maybe be kind of expanding the bulge in the middle more and more until it eventually becomes of the form of gamma 1. Now, a homotopy requires one specific condition. Well, actually, four specific conditions. A homotopy h of s comma t has to be such that h of 1 comma t has to, wait, no. h of s comma 1 has to be equal to, h of s comma 0 has to be equal to gamma 0 of s, h of s comma 1 has to be equal to gamma 1 of s, h of 0 comma t has to be equal to their shared start, and h of z, uh, 1 comma t has to be their shared end. For all s here, sorry, for all s in 0, 1 here, and all t in 0, 1 here. That's the condition for homotopy alongside one more thing. It has to be continuous, of course. Otherwise, we could just pick anything. Any two curves could be homotopic if we didn't specify that it has to be a continuous map along with these four specifications, which are why it's intuitively described as a transformation from one function, from one curve to the other. So now we are going to show that if two curves have that homotopy between them, if they're homotopic, as you might say, then 
the path integral of a holomorphic function over them is going to be the exact same. So, how would we do that? Well, the intuitive logic goes a little something like this. So what does the intuitive logic look like here? Well, say we have a domain, gamma, two points, alpha and beta, curve gamma naught, and curve gamma one. And of course, there are a bunch of curves that live in between. So, the question is, how can I prove that for a holomorphic function f, the integral of f over gamma naught is equal to the integral of f over gamma 1, given that these two are homotopic? Well, it all comes down to this. Essentially, okay, I'm saying way too many filler words here. If I take a curve in one stage of the transition, let's call it gamma S1, and a curve in another stage of the transition, gamma S2, you can probably imagine by the definition of con uh, continuity and the fact that H is continuous, that if the distance or the difference between S1 and S2 is less than some parameter gamma, and obviously greater than zero, then... The maximum, or supremum, over all t between 0 and 1, and you actually don't need the 4 all sign, of the distance between gamma 1 and gamma 2, and this would be more modulo, but it doesn't actually matter, is less than epsilon for some epsilon. So, this is essentially what continuity means. And it's what we can assume now that we know H is continuous. Well, now that we know that, what can we argue? Well, we can argue that since S1 and S2 are so close together, then we can, of course, cover them up with a bunch of finitely many disks in a way such that both S1 and S2 are covered. And no, this is not an infinite cover. This is a finite cover of disks, unit disks. And unit disks are very nice because you can define a continuous primitive over there, no matter if the function is holomorphic or not, or if its primitive is holomorphic or not. And so, since there's a continuous primitive somewhere in here, then integral of the function f over gamma naught in one of these disks is going to be, by the theorem that we proved uh, last time, the fundamental theorem of contour integrals, the end of that section minus the beginning of that section. And of course, that also goes for S2. And at the end of the day, the difference between the integral result in F in this disk between gamma S1 and gamma S2 is going to be a constant. And that constant is going to be the same over every single disk by the fundamental theorem of contour integral. And so that allows us to say that these two have an equivalent primitive because they only differ by a constant. So that's it. Thanks everyone for watching.